Okay, people, so, so much for three days off, right? We're going to veer off to the left here, okay, for a moment, because it is like the next day, Tuesday, right? Um, November 12th, 2019. In light of what I've been talking about, about Amari with the MRI and, you know, just the stress that goes around that and blah and blah. So anyway, I went to the appointment and it was... It was uh, a fairly long appointment, and initially, who I had the appointment with was was with the assistant to the actual neurologist. Okay, and the woman that I was speaking today, 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 is 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 a Muslim woman with you know her scarf and her long whatever they wear. It was beige or something like that. And um, I asked her, I said, well, where did you come from? What country? You know. And she said, from the United Emirate. And Tisha piped up, oh, and I'm like, United Emirate? Well, on my YouTube channel, there's actually, if you go into my uh, analytics, I don't know about lately, because I don't ever go into analytics and really check it out, but... You know, a couple of years ago, or the last time I looked, it's been a long time, people. Because I don't get a lot of views, so I don't worry about it, right? That's not why I'm here. <laughs> I'm right now in a field of, I feel like I'm in a field of many swords now. Because she comes from a region, right, where throughout their history, you know, they've had a lot of battles for whatever reason, right? And she was clearly a Muslim woman, right? And she was here for a two-year um, learning, quote-unquote, work visa, so that whatever she learned out here, she could take back to her country. Because I asked her, right? <coughs> I asked her <coughs> I asked her what the health care was like down there in that part of the world, but I told, I told her that I actually have people, well, I did two years ago, whenever I looked at my analytics last, that watch my channel quite regularly from the United Emirates. Right, so you know, I it it, it didn't uh, it didn't surprise me, right? It didn't surprise me that she came from there simply because I have people that watch my videos from there for whatever reason, and um, that uh, she's here in my country because my country takes immigrants from all these countries, and they tend to try and bring in the ones with. Remember I said, right, you know, they're not bringing, they, yes, they bring in refugees from the camps where there's 100,000 sitting in tents baking under the sun. They will pluck a few from there, but the majority of them that come to Canada and are building these monster homes come from countries where the economy is somewhat stable and they're more in the upper. So because of that, I asked her, I said, well, do you plan on going back and helping your own people? This is before we even got on to discussing Amari. <laughs> right? And Tisha's just like... Okay? So, and she said, yeah, that's what she wanted to do. And whether she does that or really meant what she said remains to be seen. But, um, you know, I, I got a sense that she really did want to help her people. Right? However, which way she was going to do it, she really had a heart to the home country, right? And then we had the conversation, which I'll get into, and then finally the actual doctor himself showed up, touch-based, which I'll talk about. I'm just bringing you into that field of many swords, because here we've got a Muslim woman from countries where they have a history of sword fights, <laughs> right? And then the doctor shows up, and he's got his accent, and I'm like, first thing, pretty much, where did you come from? Not in a rude way, but, like, I'm curious, like, what country did you come from, right? You've traveled a long way, tell me your tales, or at least tell me where you started from. And he said, Israel. So, I'm making a coffee for myself, people. I'm really tired, so just hold on a minute. Okay, so I'm going to call this video 
before I get on about this doctor here, a field of swords, because I feel like I'm going into a field, I've got swords, people, right, so I'm always, you know, it's kind of on my mind, right, and so, you know, I, I, I'm coming across people that come from different parts of the world with different, you know, ideologies and different religions and different beliefs and different convictions, people, different convictions, right, and and with different prejudices and biases that are built in through their religions and their uh, the societies that they come from, right? In terms of how they interact with each other as males and females, and and you know, Muslim w women, you know, depending on what region of the area that they are, you know, coming up in, you know, some of them have no like no human rights, people, right? Uh, where is it? Uh, uh, Kuwait. There's places in these parts of the world where women have no rights. And for me, when a woman wears the Muslim standard traditional attire, it starts to erode, in my opinion, as a Western woman, women's rights to be who we are, the way we want to be. It's like the nuns in the Catholic Church with their black and their white and their, you know, it's, it's no different, people. It's used as a form of, of intimidation to um, make the herd conform. And you can't conform unless you put on what they're wearing. However, the person wearing the outfit would probably say otherwise, saying, "Well, no, I come from a from a liberal Muslim uh, um, country where women are allowed to drive no matter how they're dressed. If you came to my country, you wouldn't have to put on one of those because." women are liberated in my country. I choose to wear what I wear. I don't know what the rules are in the United Emirates. Can I go just hop on an airplane, go to their country, and show up dressed like this? <laughs> With my work boots on, people? And walk freely through society without that society, that particular society, casting stones at me or pulling out their swords? I'm not going into their country and importing my ideologies, my convictions, my religious beliefs, but they're coming over here and they're doing it here. Okay? And because my government... Okay, I should really finish with this doctor first, right? Before I get into this, okay? Um... And and why I'm like I'm because I'm go I'm going to court people to get justice for my daughter to lock people up. Somebody needs to go to jail for what happened to Shemay. Okay. And um, with that said, with the fact that I do firmly believe that her organs or body tissues or body parts, including her teeth, were illegally removed from my daughter's body. And then her body was embalmed. That's... Otherwise, people, there would be no other conversation and I'd be pulling out something else and doing a video around that. Okay? But we know that I'm getting into the paperwork to prove this shit. With my own jury. And if my jury that's paying attention wants to say, No, you're wrong. You need to now go to jail yourself for falsely accusing somebody in terms of Fraser Health Authority and some of their staff. We'll just start at the top of the list right there because they're the biggest culprit, right? They didn't do everything alone, but they're the biggest culprit, people. They're the ones that are facilitating this activity. Organs are not being taken out in butcher shops. They're being taken out in hospitals. Okay? And they have to be done with fairly qualified doctors and technicians and staff and nurses and all this other crap in order to be a successful transplant. And we're not producing our own homegrown doctors because we don't invest to our 
community, as a being born in this country, right? We're on our own. We have to struggle, go into thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, depending on how far you want to go into your medical profession, right? Unless, of course, you want to cut a deal with the government and then go work up in some hick town way up in the boonies for seven years to pay off your student loan. The government doesn't want to do that. They can just simply put the call out to the United Emirates and have them come out here. Whether it's on a work visa for two years to learn so they can go back and do whatever. And then once they're here, if they decide they want to stay, they just start putting in the necessary paperwork. Within four or five years, it's a done deal, if not sooner. So what this woman feels today isn't necessarily what she's going to feel in three years from now or at the end of her term. Right? But... It's through these doctors and technicians and nurses, and she said she was a doctor. She just wasn't the doctor, right? They were both doctors, but she was a doctor on whatever. <coughs> and this dude, <coughs> this doctor, who was older, obviously, than her, and because of his accent, I asked him if he came from the same place as her, and she, he said no. He said that he came from Israel, and then he asked me where I came from, and I said, well, I was born in this country, and then, you know, but my ancestry, it comes in from Ukraine, right? And the border of Poland, up and around that time when all that shit was going on. My grandparents came from out there to here, to Saskatchewan, and then to Alberta, and then my grandmother came to Victoria, because my mother took her there. And then he said that he came from Israel, but at the time when it had a different name, he said the name, but of course I couldn't understand it. So I don't know. I've looked up, and here's the point, right, <laughs> with this little introduction. I looked up Israel, the history of Israel, to see what the name was of the city, or the, the country, right, before it became officially Israel, because that's when he would have, because I asked him, well, you know, he said, as soon as he said Israel and stuff, I kind of looked at him and I said, well, I guess you don't want to go back, right? Because there's always fighting down there, right? They're, all, they're shooting bombs to each other back and forth between Palestine and Israel and building walls, right? Because Israel is trying to remain as a Jewish state. As the United States protects Israel. But he came at a time before Israel was in that situation. So I'm thinking, okay, well, because I didn't say, well, you know, I mean, it was obvious I could see the woman was a Muslim. But, you know, when he said Israel, and, and then he made a point to say it was before it was Israel. That's where he kind of originated from. So I looked up Israel and, you know, I'm in a field of swords, people. Between the two countries, with the Muslims, <coughs> right, in that whole region, and then be in Israel now, with, and so I'm thinking, okay, you know, like, can you imagine what it's like for these workers, these people coming from these countries, leaving their social, uh, net, you know, safety nets or whatever, their, their social, um, Comfort zone, their social, their social, their social comfort zone. They leave their social comfort zone to come out here to Canada and implant themselves into some hospital that has a serious problem with uh, illegal organ harvesting people. There's no other reason for them to embalm my daughter illegally outside of giving students from another country to learn how to embalm bodies maybe they were teaching kids how to uh, students how to embalm a body or maybe they were allowing these students to you know poke this and try that and test this on a dead body just so that they didn't injure an actual real patient like you have to think deeper than oh just slice take out whatever stitch it up and move along no there's a whole there's a whole series of stuff going on and somebody's paying for this and we know that the taxpayers are paying for some of this but they're not paying for all of it people there's privatized money in this system okay and it's coming from countries like this is it coming from israel i don't know is it coming from the united emirate i don't know but it's coming from countries like this that have that stable economy 
with their billionaires, right? Obviously looking for something when they're coming to my channel, which is a nobody, <laughs> right? Watching my videos as if they could even understand my videos, assuming that they speak English. <laughs> you, you know? And then to go and take your grandson someplace where you don't even want to take him, you don't even want to deal with anybody in the healthcare system. It doesn't matter where they come from. If you could run away as far away from them as you could, you would. But I can't, people. I have to keep going back into that fucking field. I have to keep walking into that fucking fire. And when I walk in and I sit down and I talk to these people, you know, like they know something's up. Because, you know, people need to think. And stop taking things for granted. Right? And we've got culprits. We've got culprits in the healthcare system. That's not only money laundering taxpayers' dollars, but they're money laundering blood money. And being that the majority of these doctors come from different countries, we need to isolate what country is the most corrupt. Okay? Is the most which country is coming over here and corrupting the Canadian country? Because I don't want to go in there and just broad sweep everybody into that criminal, uh, criminal organization. I discussed that last night. Right? That's not practical. That's not feasible. And when I was doing my lawsuits with Uncle John, you know, I was reading up on a couple of cases um, or complaints or something. Uh, you know, it was some sort of something. I can't remember what it was. And th there was a doctor, right, somewhere in B.C. He, you know, came from a different country, whatever, you know, because that's, that's, that's what the provincial government, that's how they've, they've stacked their cards, They've stacked their cards with, you know, different ethnic individuals with, again, different ideologies and, you know, familiarities and all this other crap. And they kind of just stuck them all together and say, now you guys get along. And then just left them. They don't monitor them. They just left them. Unless, of course, the provincial government has already cut a few deals with some dirty doctors. Dirty doctors, people. So we need to figure out where these damn dirty doctors are coming from. It's not just about dirty cops. It's about dirty doctors. Right? Did I think that the doctor I spoke to today, the two of them, were dirty? No, I did not. No, I did not. However, does that not mean that... I come home. I come home. Right? Now I'm sitting here. And I'm stewing away, right? For whatever reason. And I Google. The first thing I do is United Emirates. And I'm kind of looking for organ harvesting. Just to, you know, I'm I'm gonna build a little a little portfolio on the on the different countries that have issue well, every country harvests organs now, people. It's not a hearsay, oh, they're doing it over there and they've just started it over there. Everybody's doing it now and they've been doing it for a long time and some countries and some regions within countries have better technology and are proficient with it. Okay, but there's been over the last 50 years, people, a lot of corruption around it. So anyway, you know, I'm on a hunt for the dirty doctors who did what they did to my daughter. Okay? I'm trying to understand how it even happened in the first place, people. I think this is why I'm doing it. Because I'm trying to understand how it even got to this point. Okay? And if I'm wrong, after it's all said and done, you prove me wrong. And if I need to, I will go to jail and I will pay my time. Okay? For falsely ac accusing somebody somebody's more than one in Fraser Health Authority within their staff system of being dirty. But we haven't gotten there yet. We, didn't, we don't even know if a judge will even let me talk about it in a real courthouse. If I take the time to write it, they should fucking talk about it. But they don't. They can just skirt it out the door. So anyway... Okay, so I, I Google I Google United Emirates because I, 
I, I had a feeling, I asked her if it was like, you know, what the economy was like in terms of, is there a lot of poor kids, right? You know, were you like getting, were you running, you know, I didn't come right out and say it, but I was kind of suggest like, did you leave the country? Because it was just a lot of poverty. But f I already knew that the United Emirates, because it was an Arabic country or region, right? With them over here being a doctor. We're, we're not looking at the poverty that's in that country because the level of poverty in that country is, pro is probably s small compared to an uh, African country, right? Just for the sheer fact of you're dealing with Muslims, with, you know, Arabic heritage. And um, so right there, there's money. There's that private money, people. Ching, 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 Right? And there's more than one out here. It's not just one person, you know, working in the healthcare system that came from this country because obviously Canada has done something with this country to help these people that are being educated to come over here and use our facilities to learn whatever it is that they're going to learn so that they can supposedly take that information and go back to their country. Assuming that they're not going to file landed immigrant papers. Right? And then, you know, I like, okay, I don't know much about the United Emirates. I'm just going to Google and see. I'm, I'm looking to see if they have a problem with illegal organ harvesting. Say, like, um, Pakistan. Right? Different countries have bigger problems. Right? So I Google, I'm reading, 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 going down Google, 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 and then I come across this article. I guess I could make a note of it and I can add it into add it into this video since I'm talking about it. It says the the United Arabic uh, somebody's coming up, just hold on. Okay, I don't remember what I was talking about other than this doctor, right? And, and these people and the regions from where they come from. And um, so, anyway, both of them, this is what I'm trying to say, both of them came from regions of the world where the economies of those regions are fairly stable. And they're coming in from a higher income bracket. Right? And the Canadian government is facilitating that before they're educating their own kids to fill the gap of the medical profession. But as we are immigrating these, you know, as we're bringing in these workers or immigrants, however you want to label them, into the country, we're also bringing in the um, corruption that's already established in these countries. Oh yes. Because by googling by googling um, the United Arabic oh what is it called now? Fuck man. Oh. The United Air Arabic uh, I all I have here is is it's uh Abbreviation UAE Emirate, the United Arabic Emirate. Emirate. I googled it, and then this is an article from February of 2018. People, okay, 18. This is the Muslim, predominantly Muslim country where women are taught to put their religion first in terms of wear what we tell you to wear because this book says so to show faith i suppose to be humble whatever whatever their reasons are right um They're trying to bring in new legislation to curb illegal organ trafficking. This part of the world, 
they're one of the first of six countries in that region, in that area, that are bringing in legislation. The UAE has issued regulations to govern, to govern organ transplantations, ruling out the possibility of organ trafficking in the country. Well, let me tell you, organ trafficking has been going on. The rules are, because if it wasn't, they wouldn't have brought it in. The rules are applicable to all stages of organ donation, including con conservation, transportation, transplantation. The regulation also aims at protecting the rights of organ recipients and preventing the exploitation of both recipients and donors. In other words, we're not going to sell you some dirty organs that are infected with the herpes virus and tell you that they're not. We're, they're going to make sure that people aren't getting infected organs with various pathogens that are just not good to transplant. So if you have herpes, you can kind of feel safe because they're not going to want your organs. For whatever reason, how they've justified that, because they'll take it if you have hepatitis C. If you have hepatitis C, people, they will still take your organs, but they won't take your organs if you have herpes, if you have the herpes simplex. Now, I don't know if that's directly related to chicken pox, shingles, and the herpes simplex, or if it's just rela related to the herpes simplex by itself. I would think all three, right? Because it's a herpes simplex. Chicken pox is a herpes right? Shingles is the offset of chicken pox, which is a form of herpes. But I don't do transplants, so I don't know the gist of it all. I just know that if you have herpes, they, they pass you up. So if you got herpes, consider yourself lucky. Serious. <coughs> In this instance, <clears throat> so they want to bring in regulation that's going to make sure that these organs are screened to prevent dirty organs from being sold on the black market, in a nutshell. That's what they're saying here. It, okay, and then it goes, the UAE is one of the first countries in the region to criminalize organ trafficking because it represents a profanation of human dignity. They just didn't wake up one day, people, and say, well, we're going to write this legislation because... No, they wrote it because they knew that they were having a problem and it was starting to probably get out of control, right? And because they are trying to be somewhat of a civilized society, they had to bring in legislation to keep up to par with, one, the UN and those committees and... Um, probably the World Health Organization with those committees because these types of countries sit at those kind of committees and because they're, you know, they're fair, fairly well off, they have political clout. So, th of course, they're going to put their best face forward and show that they're progressive. So this is a form of progression moving forward in the Arabic world because they're one of the first and it didn't come in until 2018, people. 2018. <coughs> so, <coughs> people that are coming in from this country are a suspect group. And does that mean that every individual is a suspect? No, it just means that they're a suspect group coming in with their own private money through their own facilitation of networking within government agencies to import their workers. And, um, use their skills to their advantage, whether it's with ill intent or honorable intent, right? Because that was too easy, people. Just Google United Arabic Emirate, and then I didn't even get down half the page on Google, and all of a sudden that popped up, right? So they have a problem, and they're trying to deal with it, and that's a good thing, you know, and so, okay... Now, as for the, the guy from Israel, right, he, like I said, he's, he made sure that he pointed out to me that before he came here, th the name of Israel was named something else. 
So I don't know how many years ago that was. He was older than I. I mean, I will ask him the next time I see him, like, can you be more specific and maybe write it down so I can Google it? Because I am kind of interested, right? Because now that I'm in Israel, dealing with somebody that came from Israel, clearly has a heavy accent. So he never lost his accent for the whole time that he's been out here. But we don't know how long he's been out here for, right? And, um, you know, he's providing services to my grandson, right? And... You know, you go to take it to Israel. So, you know, I mean, that's another that's another field of swords, people. I'm in fields of swords. So I Google Israel. I, I, I'm pretty sure they have a problem with illegal organ harvesting. I don't think it's going to be that hard to fucking find it when I actually Google Israel and organ harvesting and see just see what comes up. Because Israel's technology is more advanced then we know. Because there's a lot of PSYOP shit going on in there with the United States and God knows who else Israel is partnering up with. From my opinion, from what I know, and I don't follow this stuff, people, so I'm not no expert, but we know that Israel, you know, has technology in terms of energy weapons and that type of shit that we may not know all the true information around it. Right. Which puts them up in that, you know, with that stable income within their own country. You know, they don't, they have poverty, but they don't have a lot of it, people. And they produce, a, you know, a fairly a well educated upper class that obviously came to Canada for whatever reason. I don't know why he was, came. I don't know if he came with his parents and they were running away at the time to get away from the country or if he was educated there and migrated his family here because he just didn't like the politics of Israel. Because once he said Israel, I kind of said to him, well, I guess you don't really want to go back, eh? You know, in terms of safety? In terms of safety. Because you never know what's going to be going on between Palestine and Israel. You don't go backwards in life, right? Where the other woman, the United Emirates, they're not really fighting. They're not fighting in there. They just have their social system that she may or may not agree with, but she obviously does because she's running around out here with her attire on that clearly states that she's proud of her country and her religion. So she may go back and help her own people, right? And But at the end of the day... My government is bringing these people over here that have that upper income to establish private enterprise people. Illegal organ harvesting is called private enterprise, okay? And because there's so many of them within the hospital system, because to me, on the one being harvested, the family that's being harvested, right? I just feel like I'm 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 looking at it from a cow's perspective now. I don't even feel fucking human when I walk into these environments anymore because of what's been happening to my family. That's how intense my feelings are, people. Okay? Because somebody in that group, somebody's more than one within the larger group har harvesting Canadian people like cattle. Well, the senior public union staff of this province, like the Eleanors that have been in the fucking system for 40, 50 years and still maintain on their jobs, even as they commit crimes, facilitate this activity for their own financial rewards and gains whether it's on a union level or whether it's directly personal. Because we've got more than one player here, people. It's kind of like Fraser Health Authority and CIBC Bank. One couldn't do what the other one did without each other doing it together. Right? If CIBC Bank would have put the brakes on Fraser Health Authority and took it to fucking court through the public guardian trustee, right, patient property act, the power of attorney act, whatever fucking act they wanted to choose to take it to fucking court, 
Uncle John would have had better chances of one having a happier, healthier, longer life than what those two corporations gave him by giving him no choice. Well, it's the same thing with this. If you send back all these doctors from whatever country they come from, you know, regardless of what their motives are, whether they're good doctors, bad doctors, to send them all fucking back, what do you think the public union sector is going to do? They're not going to have their tools to take out the organs anymore. Unless, it, unless, of course, they double up and make the doctors that were educated here, which are probably far and few in between, do overtime. Right? So anyway, that's what my mind is thinking, people. Right? I'm meeting people that obviously I'm putting on guard because I'm asking them, well, personal questions. Where did you come from? But I'm not asking for the wrong reasons, people. I was very curious to know where they came from, out of respect. For me, it's out of respect. Even though I know I'm the fucking cow, I still respect them because I'm a Canadian and that's what I was taught. But being that I was taught to be polite, those same principles are being used against me and my family. And it puts me in a very vulnerable position, which makes me defensive. So, anyway, we got on to talking, blah, blah, blah. So we know where the doctors came from, okay? The woman was very patient. <laughs> uh, Tisha got a little annoyed with me because I kept asking her a lot of questions. Uh, you know, questions, and I was being firm about my questions and not only was I asking questions, but, you know, I was relaying what I knew in regards to the answers of those questions as Tisha was challenging me as if I had no right, right? Because I'm arguing with the doctor and it wasn't that I was, <coughs> this is the woman, right? I'm arguing with the woman, right? I wasn't arguing with the woman. It wasn't a form of argument. It was an intense discussion in regards to get down to... Let me remind you, I don't want my grandson being used as a pincushion or some monkey in a fucking tube. I didn't say fucking, but I did say monkey in a tube, okay, as some test subject to some 18-year experiment with his legs like this, because I don't see, see that. I came right out and said it, people. <clears throat> I don't see that as quality freaking health care. And then I draw in the idea of, well, what about these children that come in from these orphanages and places like that where they don't have that, that stable income? The United Emirate has that stable income. But if you go to your Ukraine, you go into those orphanages and those hospitals, they hardly have nothing. But those children are going through the halls, dragging themselves, you know, climbing, doing, doing whatever it is that they're capable of doing. And... They don't get the same kind of health care as the children out here. So what is the difference between the two? And being that Amari was born in Canada, obviously very grateful, but at the same time, he's not a pincushion as an experiment, right? And he's entitled to have a good night's sleep without being like this. Well, Tisha's arguing with me saying, well, they said it better at night. I'm, I said, look, Tisha, we've been through this 50 times already. Th when they put that stuff on and said this, they said he can have it on during the day as well. It does not have to be at nighttime. So the woman, the doctor, she goes, I think what's important here is that, you know, it's on. People put it on at night for the convenience of putting in the child in it putting them to bed, and then you don't have to worry about them for the next 8 to 10 hours. Right? Because they can't move, people. They're confined into that position. That's it. So, you know, if I told her, if Amari, I put him on, some nights he's good with it, other nights he's not. Right? I want to get into that routine where it's two nights on, one night off. So that he can do whatever. If it put him in the living room, you can put it on during the day. And you know, Tisha, like, you're arguing. And I'm like, no, I'm not arguing, Tisha. I'm trying to explain that, you know, that at some point there has to be a quality of living for Amari. He's not just a commodity. And that's what I told this woman. My grandson is not a commodity. Right? Because for as much as 
you you know they like it, she she even tried to say that oh you know with the uh, hippocratical oath the hippocratical oath you want the best for your patient you have the biggest dreams and hopes and outcomes so he's going to walk and I'm like, because we're going with this discussion, and I'm like, you know, like, you're doing all this stuff for something that he's not capable of doing. In regards to the MRI, we had the discussion with the MRI, because it, it went from MRI to back to this to that, right? But with the MRI, um, it was booked in as a no contrast. I was informed that halfway through the test, if they seen something, right, um, that they would, I guess, put the contrast in, in the process of whatever it is that they were doing, so that they don't have to rebook it another time. And that would be only if they seen something coming in at the time of the images coming in. That's the way I interpret it. So I ultimately said, well, if that's true, then that means I don't get a choice. Because I reminded her that I wasn't comfortable with the MRI, right? That I know that they are already sort of know where the damage is. She agreed. I reminded her that I'm not interested in defensive medicine. However, these are the things that happened to Shemaine. She had a 3D ultrasound, which I advised her not to do. It was over 30 minutes, but some of those images were in the 2D form or whatever, the standard. And then it came in to the 3D, and then it would go standard, and then it would go into the 3D. Because if you go more than 30 minutes with it, supposedly, if you go more than 30 minutes with a 3D ultrasound, it has the potential to burn the brain, harm the brain, because of the heat, people, because of the heat, right? And um, so I brought that to her attention in terms of, well, since we're doing the MRI, even though I'm under duress with the whole situation, you know, I want you to be aware because I want to know what you want to know, right? Because personally, I think he was injured at birth, personally. I told her this, but if you can show me that he was injured quite possibly through a 3D ultrasound that she paid for people, that if you Google 3D ultrasound on the internet, it will tell you that the American FDA has not approved it, right? Because there's no real long-term studies around, they just haven't approved it, people. But, you know, it's like that puppies and kittens with organ harvesting. You saved a life. Yay. Donate, donate. Yay. You save a life. But then, on the other hand, now we've got illegal organ harvesting going on in the country of Canada. <laughs> right? As babies are being injured with 3D ultrasounds because they haven't been completely uh, certified as being a potential hazard to developing fetuses. And people are making money off of it. Oh, come and come. You get a little teddy bear with the baby heartbeat. Well, maybe with that little baby heartbeat, that's why my grandson's brain is damaged. Could be, people. Could be. So I'm, I'm, I'm with the doctors, right? Because she said, no, 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 not defensive medicine, protective medicine. Because she also pointed out, and this is what I mean, like she was good with communicating with me in terms of, she let me talk it out with her, right? Because it got down to where she said, well, no, I'm not doing defensive medicine. I'm doing protective medicine because if we see something that could potentially explode, just use that as an example, because it's bubbling in there, you know, like, like a potential for a brain aneurysm or something like that, then they can build in the safety measures to prevent that from happening, Right? As well as isolate as to what part of the brain was damaged and da dee dee da da so that, you know, we can kind of put a, some fingers around it. 
because then the conversation moved on, okay, and it's still MRI, right? And this is why I'm telling you, this is why I came in. I'm, I'm giving you what happened with the MRI neurologist appointment today. Okay? <clears throat> then she said, because I, okay, I said, there's, there's, you know, she asked me general questions like, you know, how was Shemay's pregnancy? Shemay's pregnancy was pretty stressed out, people. She did a lot of heaving, you know, she fought a lot, right? Right? She hyperventilated a few times because of fighting with that scoundrel, right? But, you know, women, women can be in earthquakes and tornadoes and, you know, they can be out in the farms and there's all kinds of things that women can do that are very strenuous. That women can go through a whole lot of shit because children are like parasites. Once they latch themselves onto you, they will suck the life out of you. No matter what happens to you, they will make sure that they survive. That's what one doctor told me. He said, kids are like parasites. Once they latch on, they're going to suck the life out of you. In vitro, and when they're born, the same thing. And he was so true, people. <laughs> he was so true. Okay? Because that's basically what they do. So, you know, in terms of being injured because she was fighting and had a couple of bouts of, you know, hyperventilating or whatever, before, before Amari would get like brain injury, Shimei would start bleeding and the placenta would rip itself off from the womb and through that being ripped off the womb, that's where the lack of oxygen would come in. She didn't have symptoms of heavy bleeding. I know that because I did with Sierra. I hyperventilated with Sierra from being beat and all. I was beat with Sierra people, okay, thrown up against the wall, had my head punched out, all kinds of crazy shit. Hyperventilating, right? Eventually, I just broke away from that relationship, ran the fuck out the door, and uh, didn't look back. But at the time, see, the placenta was pulling away from all that trauma that I was going through, right? So, I almost lost Sierra. I was told to go home and to expect to lose the baby. Instead, I went home because I was bleeding so heavy because the placenta was pulling off. Instead, I went home and I ate a bunch of liver and she survived. So, in that case, you know, Sierra definitely probably suffered some lack of oxygen, right? And, you know, the trauma in her life started very young due to her dad, just by the being beat and, you know. But Shimei wasn't beat, people. She fought. She hyperventilated a couple times from being so upset. I don't think she was beat, like, I'm, I'm talking beating people. I'm not talking this crap, okay, or whatever. I'm talking like a fucking beating, okay? Beatings don't beat babies out of wombs unless you beat the stomach, okay? Shimei was not beat in the stomach, all right? So the chances of Amari being injured from her having a traumatic pregnancy due to the relationship that she is was in is small compared to maybe being injured with a 3D that went longer than the 30 minute recommended time period, right? Or she had contractions for two days, the hospital sent her home for two days, didn't test her, just sent her home, and then on the third day dragged it out for 12 hours, 8 hours, 12 hours. And then, all of a sudden, did a, an emergency C-section. Hold on. So, you know, I told her my feelings on that one. And then, because we were talking about that, you know, obviously I'm like, well, how much information do you... And, and the fact that he came out jittery, and he was jumping, right? And then, of course, she kind of, like, smoothed that one over, people. I noticed that she smoothed that one over because she said that when she read Amari's files, she noticed that, but within a, two days or whatever, it subsided, it slowed down, it stopped. It, it was enough for them to say, it's okay, you can go home because there were no more symptoms. But when he got home, it was jumpy. It was always been jumpy. Right? And, um, 
doesn't mean he wasn't brain damaged. Because basically what she said, that with the MRI that they've got going right now, which is a no contrast, okay, which is a no contrast. One for you, one for me. Okay, be quiet, I'm doing a video. Okay. Which is a no contrast video. I get one, you get one. Which okay? is a no co contrast, uh, no contrast, uh, here Andre, MRI, it won't actually pinpoint, is there truth to this? I don't know people. It won't pinpoint the time of injury because it wasn't done at the time of birth. If Amari got injured at birth, she said that the MRI needed to be done then in order to confirm the injury for that time. But because they said that his jitteriness subsided, right? Um, it removed the it removed the responsibility from the hospital in terms of it certified that Amari wasn't injured, based on their records. Based on their records, right? Even though I have video. I said babies don't do that. So it's still up for debate, people. Right? And whatever they're going to tell us is more protective medicine than it is anything else at this point other than, yeah... If they see something that needs future monitoring because it has the potential to explode in terms of it's a, it's a, it's it's the beginning of an aneurysm a hot spot right hold on a minute then it makes it all worthwhile because they're not going to be able to determine when it happened or how it happened outside of a few speculations along the way. Right. And then it went on to just other stuff. Right. Because, you know, he's still stiff. I don't. I don't do a lot of vigorous exercises and moving his arms around and stuff. I guess you have to be more vig. I'm not a very. No, I'm not like. Come on, <laughs> like that, right? I can be rough with lumber, but I can't necessarily be rough with children. And I guess when you do these exercises, therapeutic stretches or whatever. You have to be fairly firm when you do it. So I said that the next time he goes to that um, physiotherapy, I'll go and I'll have them walk me through it. Because they walk Tisha through it. Tisha, you know, does. But even Tisha's not being firm enough. But because we don't want to hurt him. That's what it is, people. Right? Sometimes I just. So anyway, and then he offered um, um, the, the the doctor came in right after uh, discussing forty five minutes, point by point by point by point, right? In terms of uh, Amari's future MRIs. If he's not showing any ab abnormalities outside of the injury, in terms of a potential area that can have an aneurysm and, you know, be a problem in 20 years from now, 
then we may not ever have to do this again. But just the way the healthcare system is set up to uh, feed the beast, right, at the expense of the cattle, in a political realm, in a political realm, people, does that mean that those doctors seen my son as cattle, to my grandson today like cattle? No, obviously not. Not in a conscious mind anyway. Right? But from the regions where they come from, from the regions from where their history, their family lineage and all this stuff comes from, they have slavery in their history. Both countries. Both, both doctors. They have a long history of battles with swords. <laughs> right? Muslims are all about swords. And in the region of Israel, it's full of swords, right? And then in 1099, the first crusade took Jerusalem, Jerusalem and established a Catholic kingdom, right? Known as the Kingdom of Jerusalem. During the conquest, both Muslims and Jews were indiscriminately massacred or sold into slavery. But yet, the Muslims and the Jews are still fighting today between themselves at the border of what? Gaza? Isn't that what it's called? Because the Palestinians want their land back and the Israelites, or Jewish people, are saying, no, this is ours. Because they've been battling with swords forever. <laughs> right? Right? But, at the end of the day, there come, these people are coming in from countries that are politically well-established, for the most part. Because when I get into the United Emirate, um, Arabic Emirate, you know, no sh national gross product or whatever that's all called, right? You know, you know where they are on the, on the world economical, mm, what is it called, Wall Street? It's not suffering people. I mean, Arabic people have a history of slavery against blacks, right? And organ harvesting. They do. That's why they brought in that uh, legislation in, in freaking 2018. Because they have to put their best best face forward at the UN table. Right? So that's basically where I'm at with this right now. When I go see that doctor again, I'm going to ask him, well, what are you? Do you speak, what is it called? Hmm. Arabic? I was reading, but my eyes hurt. They have different languages there in Israel. They have the Jewish language, which is Hebrew, right? Or something or something like that. They have the Arabic language. And then, of course, you've got the Catholics in there. I'm eating a Jamaican patty. <laughs> My son gave it to me. I have to read all this. Maybe not read it all, but as I work on my lawsuit... You know, you have to know your enemy, right? You have to know what you're dealing with. These people were not my enemy. I told that doctor that he he had a good assistant. She was a good woman, right? She was reasonable in terms of answering my questions to the best of her ability. I couldn't acknowledge that. She tried to reassure me that I had a choice in what procedures I allow Amari to have or not. And of course... We know there's a difference of opinion on that one.
right? Will I talk on this topic again? I don't know. Maybe. Probably. Because this is where this illegal organ harvesting is coming from, people. From qualified people. People who know how to do it. And they're using Canadian facilities to teach other people how to do it. Whether they realize it or not. Okay, so I kind of ended it up, ended that abruptly, right? Just because these videos get long, right? And, but, you know, after I got off, right, like, I, I, I just, uh, it's called the United Arab Emirate, Emirate, okay? That's where that woman came from, which is, again, up in with that social, like, you know, it, it, it's, its economy is fairly stable, right? So anyway, I, I just Googled, um, well, I didn't Google anything, I just went, I, I just went off the page that I had just, I, this crumbs, <laughs> I printed it out, you can see, right, because I want to know who's harvesting organs out here, people, I do, I want to know where it's coming from, because it's either Canadians harvesting ourselves, or it's immigrants coming in, cutting backroom deals with somebody, somebody within the public union sector that's higher up. Well, this, well, the workers themselves may or may not be aware of what's going on. Because we don't know what they're being told. Okay? So, before I clicked out of everything, because I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, I'm just going to make a mental note of it and start adding it in to a hypothesis. Is that what you call it? A hypothesis, right? You're, 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 you're formulating a, a, a speculation in terms of uh, what's going on, right? It becomes a hypothesis. The hypothesis is, well, if you're getting all these upper to middle class immigrants coming in that are educated to take out organs, and they're coming in from countries that have this problem and have had it since 1980, right? And they just brought in legislation to curb the problem in 2018, basically, within that whole fucking region, as everybody's out there fighting with swords every hundred years. One religion clashes with another religion, right? That political genocide. Kind of what's going on out here. The only one is that has swords right now is me. In the old days, everybody would be running around with swords and we'd all be fighting with each other. Right? You're either the invader or you're protecting your land, one or the other, right? You can't be the middleman. So anyway, I came across another article and lo and behold, what do I see? I'm going to read it to you and then I'm going to end it on this note. In the early 1980s, a new form of human, a new, a new form of human trafficking, a global trade in kidneys from living persons to supply the need and demand of transplant tourism, emerged in the Middle East, Latin America, and Asia. The first scientific report on the phenomenon, published in the Lancet in 1990, documented the transplant odyssey of 131 renal patients from three dialysis units in the United Arab Emirates and Oman. They traveled with their private doctors to Bombay, private, right there. Private doctors to Bombay, now Mumbai, India, where they were transplanted with kidneys from living suppliers organized 
by local brokers trolling slums and shanty towns. The sellers were paid between 2000 to 3000 for a spare organ. On return, these transplant tourists suffered an alarming rate of post-operative complications, but of course we're not going to have that in Canada because we have one of the better healthcare systems, so much so that we got students coming from the Middle East to study here as they set roots. And mortalities resulting from mismatched organs and infections, including HIV and hepatitis C. However, they are harvesting organs with people with HIV and hep C. So don't let that distract you away from what's going on here because they have what you call profusion, profusion machines which flush the organs of their blood and toxins before they transplant them. We don't know how those organs in this situation were transplanted because this was in the 1980s. But now they have machines that can clear out because they, they take people with hepatitis C and will transplant those organs as well as in some cases they're now doing it with HIV. Where am I? There was no data on or discussion of the possible adverse effects on the kidney sellers who were still an invisible population of anonymous supplier bodies similar to deceased donors. Now we're just talking mainly about kidneys. Okay? And India in Punjab which is another above the social status in terms of their economy is fairly stable and they have advanced technology in organ harvesting based on that economy. So, in 1997, I co-founded Organ Watch, Organs Watch, sorry, Organs Watch, specifically to draw attention to the then- invisible population of kidney suppliers. Today, human trafficking for organs is a small, vibrant, and extremely lucrative business that involves some 50 nations, people. We're not talking 50 states. We're talking 50 nations. And then it goes on, Blah, blah, blah. I'll provide the link because, you know, this right here, no cadavers wanted. That's for another day. The point is, you know, by the time I left that environment with those people, I did let them know what happened to my daughter's body in terms of being illegally embalmed with more than likely something removed from her more than just her teeth. Okay. And then I didn't want taxpayers' money being used for monkey experiments in a tube, right, while my grandson was a pincushion, simply because it was a test that they could order to be defensive medicine. And then that's when the, well, we're being protective because we don't want some sleeper aneurysm to explode 20 years down the line. And then I feel bad because I didn't catch it when I had the chance. That's basically what she said to me. Doesn't matter the rationale or the reasoning around this MRI. The debate will never be settled until we have it. From what I've been told, I've been informed that if for some reason in the middle of the process of this MRI, they feel that they need to go into that contrast mode, they're going to do it, from my understanding, at that time versus rebooking the appointment and doing it some other time. I don't know. Hopefully, we'll only have to see this neurologist once to get the results and never have to look back, people. But being that Canada likes to just invest their money into the healthcare system that at the end of the day destroys a lot of lives, okay? Whether they want to admit it or not, 
I don't know. I don't know, people. I don't know. We got two countries on the list now in terms of as to what happened to Shimei and who did it.